Welcome to another episode of Top Lines and Tales, and as we near the end of our series looking at native livestock from the UK, once again I'd like to thank our sponsors, Harbro, who of course are suppliers and manufacturers of quality livestock nutrition. Black cattle have not only been in Wales since the Bronze Age, but featured in everything Welsh from folklore to poetry to romance to stamps. I'm delighted to have on the podcast this week a breeder of long-standing, Alwyn Jones from Denby in North Wales. And uh, welcome to the to the programme, Alwyn. Thank you very much. And I'm ashamed to admit that uh, you might be the first Welsh person that uh, we've had on this show. And uh, I'll also admit that this episode may be a bit of a challenge for me, pronouncing some of those uh, long names <laughs> with a lot, a lot of L's. And, <laughs> and, and you've got a bit of a challenge there, Alwyn, as well. I think the weather's just coming against you just now, too. Yeah, that's it. And oh, when the the Welsh black cattle weren't always black, though, were they? They're not all black anyway. Didn't Darwin mention that some of them were white with red ears? I don't know when that would be, the 1850s, I guess. Well, there are some Welsh white still about and some belted Welsh still, still about uh, in North Wales here, um, around the Merionith area. Um, they sell them in Dorgetha, now and again, you know, and they go through as Welsh white. Uh, then, um, but we are the Welsh Black Cattle Society, aren't we? You know, mm-hmm. um, there, there are a few with a red in them, but mainly those were mainly in Canada okay. and Australia. We have had very few in this country. I think we get the odd grey brownish one mm-hmm. once, but um, you know, like we like them to be um, the identity of colour really varies from. Uh, rusty to jet black, okay. R- rusty at the tips, really, you know. And would they discriminate uh, against the ones that have got blemishes on them within the society, or do they let them register them everything? Oh yeah, they're, they're registered, um, but uh, we, as breeders, we do look for anything that has got white. We uh, white is allowed mm-hmm. on the underbelly as far as the navel, uh, up to the navel, but anything in front of the navel, navel, we just uh, um, take it as, you know, but they are registered. Okay, Okay, that's cleared that up then. So there are a few coloured ones, but obviously they are a black breed. And if we go back to Wales as a country, really, it's a country steeped in folklore like no other, really. There's stories of elves and mystical cows from the underworld, and to the outside of this, it could all appear a little bit farcical, but it's taken very seriously, isn't it, the folklore in Wales? Yes, yes, it is. You know, the, as you mentioned, that they were on stamps and things like that. But also, the first bank in Wales was with the Welsh black cattle on it, and because this was during the drovers' time, uh-huh. and they became their cash. Really, the cow became their cash. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that in a second. And uh, I think in this episode, it's probably time we did explore the origins of maybe all cattle in UK with. Uh, uh, a little bit more of an ancient history lesson, and I thank um, Jenny Buckton for her help with a wonderful book that I've been reading. And So eventually science did prevail, and studies proved that the origin of the cattle in Wales came from the Uruk, or the European ox as it was, uh, as did pretty much all the breeds in UK, developing as far back as the Bronze Age, as I mentioned, when uh, they'd apparently walked across the frozen sea to the UK from, from somewhere else, and uh, 7,000 years ago, and Seemingly the, the woolly mammoth and the hippopotamus and the rhino all came as well, but they didn't survive the, the Ice Age. But uh, these oryx did, and, and they were big cattle. Uh, or when the Caesar was said to describe them, uh, the oryx, as uh, beasts slightly smaller than elephants. Yes, yeah, they were quite huge animals, really. But we tried, we tried to keep them, you know, size-wise. Uh, we'd like um, a deep cow shorter legs these days you know but mm-hmm. but get the depth of body in them certainly there will have been a change since the original oryx and if we carry on through neolithic times it would be the spanish from the basque region who would first populate wales and domesticate the oryx around 2500 bc so still a long time ago falling forming settlements on the lower lands of course and archaeology shows us that after the domestication the animals did become smaller once they'd been moved away from their natural habitats in the mountain forests and the the iberian spanish would uh, have also brought their own cattle with them we know a little bit about the spanish cattle because of course they were the origins of the texas longhorn in america as well so good cattle i think they brought across but i guess by crossing those and maybe killing the larger ones as you said the the animals in wales got down to a a more manageable size would that be about right 
yes, yeah. You know, like to finish a beast, a good Welsh black bullock in the olden days, I mean, the Father's Day, you know, we'd be finishing them at 1,500 weights, which would have been 750 kilos, yes, yes. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas now, in the modern times, they don't want anything much above 620, sure. 30, do they, you know. Sure, so. sure. Sure. And again, with our history lesson here carrying on during the Iron Age, the British weather pattern started to settle down to something like we have today, where it's uh, the land's a bit wetter in the west and a bit windier in the west as well, all in the moment. And uh, a pattern of moving animals onto the higher ground in the summer evolved, and uh, where entire farms would move from one place to, to one time of the year and then uh, up onto the mountains at the other time of the year. And this this pattern sort of re-emerged yeah. back in the Middle Ages again, but it was not uncommon in Wales and Scotland through through to the 19th century, where they just, they just decamped up to the hill and then uh, back down again in winter. Yes, this would be known as the Havod and Hendre in Wales, the Havod being the summer residence up in the mountains, and the Hendre being the um, residence down in the valleys, mm. you know, so... Like the the stock would be kept out all winter, really. Uh -huh. um, in them days, they wouldn't have buyers, and that's what the yeah. good traditional Welsh black is all about. That, of course, and that, of, of yeah. course, and, and and the cow buyers it did emerge as early as 700 BC, and uh, there's certainly evidence of of the basic plough being used before the Roman times anyway, and it was thought that uh, with this, the settlements around the fertile areas, obviously the riverbeds arrived, and seeds would be sown, and this, of course, gave rise to the, the oxen and the requirement of the oxen to, to till the land, and the cattle took on a, a different form because of that, and it's noted that most civilised areas of the UK, they say the Celtic ox would have replaced the auric a little bit, uh, as it's a bit more p possibly domestic, but they were originally would have been an oxen, wouldn't they? Yes, yes. Um, a friend of ours, I should think, would be in, uh, William Jones Carberson, which you would have known uh, mm -hmm. through Smithfield. Mm -hmm. And he he did uh, make a programme of oxen uh, pulling carts and things like that uh, in the early 90s, I think, he made a programme about it. Brilliant. They've still got the strength to do it. And, of course, the animals did evolve a little bit into a different shape once, the, once when they were needed by being heavier front shoulders. But let's just move to this history lesson because I think our readers might find it quite fascinating that it, it should be mentioned that these Western Spaniards were, of course, what we now call the Celts and uh, a pretty barbaric race back then they were. And uh, I won't say still are. And some, they were mainly driven from Britain due to subsequent evasions, of course. And then, but they remained in the poorer lands more in the West, bringing with them the tradition and the language and the art and even aristocratic rule. And again, well documented that the Celts had a tendency to fall out with each other, uh, often raiding areas and nicking anything they could get their hands on, including slaves and women. And of course, livestock. And there was no currency back then, as you mentioned just now. The cow became a form of currency, didn't it? Yes, yes. Um, there's reports from Anglesey alone going to London, there would be 14,000 head of cattle going from Anglesey yeah. on a yearly trail down to London, going through Bala and through Dinas Mouthway, down to the borders and then down to London. Incredible. I know you know, I know. my friend Bob Hoke has been uh, looking at the cow trails in, in the UK just recently, and it's right there. Incredible amount of animals that were driven drove by those drovers. We'll maybe touch on that in a second. If we just sort of wind our way through this, originally the Romans um, set up trading routes throughout Britain, which, of course, would include the River Severn out of Wales, but... Uh, as their rule went on, and while the Romans were trying to suppress the, the, and invade Scotland, uh, the Welsh generally in, embraced Roman culture a little bit more, for a while anyway, and uh, good guys, the Romans, weren't they? They brought a lot of good ideas with them, a lot of it's probably still there. Yes, yeah, they brought a lot of good things, especially um, road structures and the bridge buildings and, you know, to, to go across the ravines and uh, places of steep... Uh, it made it a lot easier to walk these stock from place to place, you know. You know. Sure. And then the Romans left, of course, and the, the Irish took a fancy to the Welsh coast for a while until the, the Saxons got involved and they took just about everything in England, including Mercia, of course, which is the border county of the Midlands as we know it now. And 
from there on they started to strangle the trade routes from Wales and uh, they had a good go at raiding uh, Wales too, didn't they, until some bloke called Offa built a wall between them and uh, I was never quite sure whether it was built to keep the Druids in or the English uh, out. Uh, perhaps that's a discussion for another day. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I, I think it was to keep the English out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> You'd say that. I don't blame me. And the, the country then united under Llewellyn the Great until uh, William the Conqueror came along and built a lot of castles in Wales and everybody seemed to get on, rub along together quite happily, I think. And uh, there'd be a few greedy landlords, I suppose, would take over some of the better land, but uh, maybe that's a simplistic English view. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, but you, you know, when when you get good English landlords, it doesn't make a difference, does it? You know, like, uh, I'll, I'll touch on one um, family that have, with the Welsh black cattle, and he's chairman of the Welsh blacks at the moment, and he's the ninth generation the ninth generation to farm and uh, really? you know and there still would be some of the, the the bigger estates would still be in place wouldn't they although a lot of it's now been replaced with the family farm there still would be some big estate estates around N- not many in wales now they've uh, virtually you know the like the hewless estate still going in bala mm-hmm. robin price's uh, family still um but the, otherwise there's very few other estates uh, in wales you know with big numbers of farms. Okay, well, I'm sorry to, to to make this into a history lesson, and we'll 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 put that to, to bed now. But it's nice, I think, for our listener just to sort of hear a, a potted history of Wales, because I said it's not uh, very often we get the we've had the Welsh on this program. Anyway, that's enough history for one day. Let's move on to the cattle. And uh, during the Norman times, the value of a cow could possibly be worth more than the land it stood on back then. You know, by the 1300s, agriculture was the mainstay of the nation, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing with the cow. You had milk, meat, milk, meat, and and, and, and something to pull your pull your plow as well. You got it, uh, got it always. Yeah, versi- ver- such a versatile animal, wasn't it? Mm, indeed, indeed. And by the early 1700s, we heard of, of the rinderpest, which wiped out so many cattle across uh, the UK, especially in Scotland. But I think the the Welsh black mainly survived that one. And by the late 1800s, you mentioned just now, but something like 50,000 head of stall cattle were sent from from Wales to England annually although I don't think the Welsh farmer themselves would take a lot of profit from these, and, and neither would the cattle retain their Welsh identity. I think the drovers would sort of take the, the cut out of them and then they would just sell them on as, as their own, I suppose, and they, they would lose a little bit of their identity as a Welsh black, wouldn't they? Yes, yes, they would. And would there be a place in the mining industry for draft oxen back then? I don't think there was. They'd be too big, I should think, the more pit ponies, weren't they? You know, they'd be smaller ponies, okay. you know. Okay. I don't think they were involved in in mining. I don't think so. I've certainly never seen any evidence of it myself. And would I be right in saying that uh, around that time would be the beginnings of a north and south divide in Wales? And I don't want to get into politics here, or when I, I know you're in the north, but the the land in the far south is hugely different to that in the north, isn't it? Especially in the very far southwest, richer soil, possibly. Would the would the Welsh cattle be different in in each of those areas back then? Oh yes, yeah the. Two main breeds in the in the eighteen seventies, seventies would have been the Castle Martin, the South Wales Pembrokeshire Welsh cow, which would Welsh black cow, which would have been the milkier type and would have been used for for the dairy business. And in the north, it would have been the Anglesey cow and many honest cow, which would be, you know for suckler herds sure, and, and, to rear calves. And more suited to, to higher land, I guess. And and it's interesting yeah, that you yeah. say that, that the, I mean, the original county names of the cattle, such as the Pembrokeshire and the Cardigan, as you said, and the Anglesey and the Carnarvonshire, all these different, they were all, they, they retained their, their identity of breeds right the way through till, till almost the beginning of the 20th century. Yes, and what's so good about it, I've uh, where, where I've lived now, We've been in three different counties, really, but we've still identified by county, by the old 13 boundary counties of Wales. Okay. You know, so we're in Denbyshire, Carnarvonshire, still the same, Merionethshire, mm-hmm. Montgomery, mm-hmm. Glamorgan, you know, none of these new, you know. You're showing your age now, I know what you mean. The, the, the new counties came in, what, the, the 70s, where we had sort of Powys mm-hmm. Power and Gwynedd and what have you, but the original counties are still there and the boundaries are still... Definitely. You know, Def- Rad- Radnor Breckenshire, you sure. see. Keradigion yeah. uh, is the only one that's really changed its name. Mm-hmm. If we if we go for a description of the cattle, just to our uninitiated listener of that time, Darwin said that the 
both breeds of the North and the South were, and Darwin would be where in 1850, was it he wrote the origin of the species, I think, and he said yeah. he said yeah. the cows are ranging from 700 to 1,000 pounds, so that's 350 to 500 kilos, so, so they, they weren't particularly big by the middle 1850s, they'd be bigger now, wouldn't they? Yes, yes, yeah, they, we would be bigger cows now. Mm-hmm. Modern farming, I suppose, has helped there, uh, able to get better land sure. as well, you know, because... In them in the, in them days, there would be no tractors, no nothing. Would we be horse plow, as you said, be oxen mm-hmm. plowing? Mm-hmm. So it would take days to plow a field, whereas now we you plow a field, <laughs> plow a field in, in an afternoon and be back home for tea time. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, and obviously, the industrial revolution um, came along, and farming did change, and the horses came into it, which uh, replaced the, the the oxen, and then the train came along, provided easier transport. So that that was a huge change for farming across the country, and. Uh, during that time, also improved breeds or improver breeds, should I say, like the shorthorn appeared, which ended up getting crossed into quite a few other breeds to to improve them. But uh, the Welsh breed didn't really, really respond to to that improvement by by outside blood, did it? I think the breed had to improve itself from within. Oh yes, yes, we they've kept very pure. You know, some of the north and south have mixed, but not many. You know, the, 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 the traditional. Uh-huh. The, the, you know, like. Very few bulls are uh, produced in the south um, to be sold to the north. That the south do come and buy bulls off the north uh, from North Wales. Uh, and you know, as uh-huh. later on, I'll mention that it's you know the main bull sale now is Dorgesa. Yeah. Whereas in the sixties and seventies, you had Menabridge, Sandroost, mm-hmm. uh, Dorgesa, mm-hmm. Santovery. Uh, you know, Re- regional, and, and Monmouth yeah. now, mm-hmm. Abergavenny, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, regional. But that did, divide still, did still stay in place, though, for a while. And a man called Morgan Evans went out on a limb, I believe, and had a herd of, uh, of both North and South uh, um, uh, Welsh black cattle there. Which I think he tried to produce a herd book in 1867, but uh, nobody was particularly interested at that time. And then a herd book eventually was compiled uh, by J. Bowen in 1874. But I think that was just the southern type cattle, is that right? I think there were 96 yes, females yeah. and 56 bulls in that book, but they would just be the south ones, would they? Yes, yeah, yeah. And then even after the second herd book, there was still a resistance to crossbreed from the, from county to county, let alone from north to south. And many yes, pe- many yeah. people thought just by just doing this, it would lead to deterioration, which uh, which is um, quite, quite surprising, I think, when a lot of people at that time were looking to improve by, by crossbreeding. These people were keeping them very pure. And it was the second book was produced by R.H. Harvey, who himself did have some crossovers. Are those books still around, uh, Alwyn? No, I don't think, um, uh, unless they're in the Welsh Black, with the Welsh Black Cat. And at the 1878 Liverpool Royal Show, the breed got some, some testing comments from judges and the public alike due to their diversity. So there obviously was a difference between them. And, and at the time, there was a call even to have different classes for the North compared to, to the South. So they still were not getting along is probably the right word. And uh, 1883, the North responded by having their own herd book compiled by William Jew. And 1884, the South Welsh Black Society was formed under the Earl of Cowder, as you mentioned. I think he was from Scottish descent originally. Those of you that know your Shakespeare, of course, Cowder Castle is a, a nairn up in the in the north there, and I'd imagine that's the same, yeah, same yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then both societies carried on producing their own herd book uh, each until eventually the North and the South amalgamated in 1904, as you just mentioned, to form the Welsh Black Society at, at a meeting in Swansea. And J. Thomas and Son would be secretary in New Herd Book in 1905 would list 177 breeders. A thousand registered cows would roughly be split between two thirds to the south, and the office would be in Haverford West, of course, which is in the south. Uh, but uh, William Jew from Bangor in the north would become the official auctioneer. So sharing it around, Alwyn, but that's about when the, when everybody got themselves together, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that 1904 herd book, as you said, would still be would still be there'd be editions of that around now for for people to see, I guess. Although probably a, yes, a valuable yes. possession if you have one, I guess. <laughs> it is very valuable. The one came up for sale. Um, was donated by family of late member, and uh, a few years ago, I think he made three or four hundred pounds. Yeah. 
Yeah. For a ten pound book. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of those old books now that do make that money as well. And I think as time yeah, goes on we're yeah. all I collect quite a few old books myself and uh, they're great yeah. great things to have and look back on. And let's move on into the twentieth century. Then in nineteen nineteen, uh Jay Thomas was replaced at the helm by another Thomas, no relation, and eventually after some wrangle he was paid for his services from 1930 onwards at 100 pounds a year so that's your breed secretary and i'm sure they earn that more now more than that nowadays but and this appointment then moved to moses griffith in 1948 who also ran the egrin herd and uh, i think he was quite a smart man moses into all, all sorts of other things as well i believe yes yes and it was down to him really that the super cow came about i think okay. the super registration of cow came about through well he he was instrumental in my father becoming a member mm-hmm. back in the in the sixties. Okay. He would he would he would be going to Coit Koch mm-hmm. to see the the herd in Coit Koch and he would call at home and we had black cows at home. He'd see them and uh, of course he'd uh, call and try to mm-hmm. get us to join sure. and that's how we joined. Sure. You know? Okay, and that was Moses and, and he said that he was replaced by Gwilym Williams Edwards, a secretary in nineteen fifty one and again a very enthusiastic man and he modernized the role I think quite a bit and introduced reports and etc which have come in quite handy obviously for research today and and he promoted he'd probably be the first one to promote the Welsh black as a female breed, wasn't he, as well as canvassing interests from overseas. He 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 was he was looking yeah. to tell people this is a cow that, uh, that that you can you can work with, you know, as a female. And he died in the role in nineteen seventy four, um which time much due to, to Edwards, the membership had grown to fifteen hundred and twenty members and hundred and sixty of those were from out with Wales. So uh registrations in nineteen seventy two over six and a half thousand. So um and a permanent staff of ten in the office. So that they'd be they'd be the halcyon days then by the middle seventies, I guess, for the breed. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. They would be glory days of the blacks, wouldn't they, you know? Indeed. Um, and of course just pre pre the Charolais coming in, we'll maybe look at that how that came came in into into um to interfere, should I say, later on. But you mentioned that, that, uh, go on. that is an interesting um uh, the Farmers March uh, produced their sixtieth uh, anniversary book a few years ago and they had a few pictures in there and they were all black cattle. Mm-hmm. Not a, not. A, I think in the whole picture, I think there was one Land Rover and trailer in it. <laughs> you know, and all the others would be livestock. You know, yeah. it's how things have changed. Sure. You know, uh, through uh, uh, in agricultural in general, isn't it? You know, yeah. not just the. You know. Indeed, indeed. I actually, I've, I've been furnished with a few of those pictures from uh, from Hugh Jones. Hugh, Hugh Bostridge, yeah, yeah. yeah, Hugh, yeah. So I'll, we'll have some of those up on on our Facebook page later. Just going back to you mentioned earlier on the super cow. The super cow register was launched, I think, in 1964. What constituted a super cow, um, Alwyn? Can you give us elaborate a little bit on that? Because it sounds like a great thing to, to introduce it to any breed. It was the cow had to be had had to have had three calves. Right. All cows must have had three, at least three calves before they can be considered. Mm-hmm. Uh, application for entry had to be applied and uh, you had to pay. And then the panel would come out. Um, applications had to be submitted, uh, given data carving so that inspection could be arranged and within 30 days of the next carving sort of thing. And then in order to try and obtain uniformity, all the cows w- would be inspected in what, in the same year by the same panel. Right. Okay. That's... So there'd be a panel of people going out to see the cows and uh, they'd be the same that went everywhere in that year. Right. You know? Roughly how many, what, did, what sort of percentage of cows would make it to a super cow, would you know? Oh, in 66, I think there was... 12? 12, only 12 super cows in, in, yeah, in the, okay, yeah. so we are talking the best the best of the best, and would these animals get accolades by being at the shows as well, was there any, any merit from, from winning championships with it with the same cows? Oh yes, yeah, um, all cows, they have the super register cow behind them in, if for the sales and the shows and whatever, you know, it's uh, good mothers and milkers and regular mm-hmm. breeders and would they then um, become the backbone of the breed just purely by the fact that they were they were such strong animals? Would they start? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Everybody, you know, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, everybody was looking for uh, if they had a heifer or something in a sale out of a supercar. We, we, you know, it was looked out and mm-hmm. made the best prices normally, you know. Sure, sure. Okay. And what a great um, idea. And that's something I've not heard of. In, in there have been other breeds yeah. where they have tried to, certainly in the Ling breed, where they've tried to sort of maintain the quality of the animals by inspecting the, the mothers before bulls could be sold. But I've not really heard of a, of a breed that's put a, a supercar register together before. That's very forward thinking, I think. And yeah. uh, as you said. Oh, yeah, it was very forward thinking by Moses Griffiths and, and uh-huh. those in them days, uh, William Edwards, you know. And the thing is, with the super cow, you know, it's very typical. We've got today the body sum, you know, and it's exactly the same qualities, really. But we, you, you give you give figures these days. In them days, it didn't give you the figures for each um, category. Now there's a category... And the figures are given for each category, and you, you end up with a. If you're very good, it's ninety plus. Mm-hmm. If you're eighty-five to ninety, it's good. Um, you know. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And all bulls that are sold through the society now have got to have the mother's body some. Okay. To, yeah, to improve the... Okay, let's say with computers with everything now, of course, it's a lot easier to, to put all these data and these results together. And uh, But obviously all that stems back to uh, to the forward thinking of these guys. And let's just move on a bit. Yeah. By the later 70s, it became a, a tougher time for all the native breeds, as we've discovered on this podcast series. And uh, the blacks fell from favour a little bit. And, uh, and W.O. Roberts was uh, quoted as saying maybe the quality had fallen a little bit too by the late 70s. Would that be a bit unfair? Um, it would be a little bit unfair in that late 60s, early 70s, the Germans and the Canadians came over and they only wanted the best. And herds like the Hussek herd sold the best and, you know, they'd gone, hadn't they? Mate. And they went in droves to Canada and... Australia, New Zealand. And, and we've had, again, the conversations that we've had on these podcasts, you can't condemn these people for selling the best when they could see maybe the writing on the wall and all the con- continental breeds and that were coming in. But it does, in hindsight, it does seem a shame that uh, some of the seed corn was so- sold. And uh, we hope people, yeah, hope people learn yeah. lessons from that in, in, in later days. And, uh, you know, well, it's funny, we, we I've been fortunate enough, enough to visit Australia, New Zealand and Germany with the World Conference that we have every four years with the Welsh Blacks. And we went to Australia, and there was a cow there. She was going back to feed Garnet, you know, right. breeding. Okay. And, oh, you know, and, and keep it. superb cow, and still calving at 21 or 22 years old. And I... Excellent. That's what we need to hear. That's uh, the longevity <laughs> of, of any breed is, uh, yeah. is, is the profit, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Is the profit. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then we look at uh, Di Davis took over the helm, but uh, he couldn't really prevent the introduction of continental bulls in in many herds and registrations and memberships declined. Of course, and then BSE in 1989 stopped the export market as well, and by 1994 it's moved on a little bit now that uh, the, the the classes were cancelled at the Royal Show and the Royal Highland, and uh, I think. Um, Davis's 21 year stint ended and uh, it was a tough era wasn't it for all breeds around about that time up through up through into the 90s yes uh, but uh, what happened I think we won the Burke um, trophy didn't we at the Royal Show yep. in the end in the year 2000 I think it was yeah with William Martin Stewart's cattle you know and uh, it brought back a little bit of, uh, of interest Yep. interest into the into the cattle I think sure I was going to mention that you did win that and we'll probably give it another mention in a second and enter after it to uh, Di Davis of course in came Evelyn Jones and uh, again extremely keen in, in the breed and I remember Evelyn and she applied for and received a half a million pound grant from the Welsh Government to form something called the, the 5B project to promote the breed and I remember her well I think she might still be at the, in the society isn't she uh, oh, and what did the 5B project achieve what was that about well, it's a forefront, really, of the battle uh, to eradicate Yonis or John's disease okay. and enable the breed to secure exports uh, eventually to Denmark and Germany. Uh, OK. You know, but as, as in the 70s, we have not seen many of the cattle on offer from the the herds, like, like the Castell and the Kennen herd, who, who in 2014... Had thirty cattle exported right. to those countries, you know, and of course we haven't seen previous to the, to two thousand and fourteen. 
Kennan and Castell used to be in Llandovery there and they'd have 10 or 15 cattle, mm-hmm. heifers, good heifers for sale, mm-hmm. you know, and we've lost them in this sort of this era. generation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, and just going back to that 5B, so you're saying the 5B project was basically a health scheme, was it, to to, to, to make sure that the cattle had um, gained enough health status that they were for export, is that right? Yes, yes, and... Another thing that came about it was bull trialing. You see, um, at Ibers, uh, you know, mm-hmm. back in the sixties, it was at Lacey Heath, wasn't it? You know that the trials had done on, done on the bull, mm-hmm. whereas you know the Ibers came in Aberystwyth, and I think I think the first year eighteen bulls went in, mm-hmm. and they were all fed the same thing, and to see which one had the best of daily gain yeah. and. And that, you know, and that would, a lot of that was done across breeds as well, across other breeds as well, wasn't it? So to, to, to and the figures are all published, and you know, and, and great, yeah, the, yeah, the weight recording side of it obviously improved a lot of breeds, um, starting with those uh, with those early trials. And and talking of trials, of course, you still have inspections of, of all bulls today. I think, in fact, there's a classification is it, highly important for the Welsh black right the way through, isn't it? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not many breeders will enter a bull um, not to be able to sell him in the sale. So, so they, yeah. Are they inspected on farm before the sale or they just inspected when they arrive at, at Dolgetha? Inspected in, in Dolgetha, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and something I need to clear up here, the breed of course to our overseas listener, the Welsh breed of course is, is very much known as a horned breed, but is there a, a polled variant out there? I believe there is. There is, yes. Um, mainly, again, in the south. Um, mainly in Carmarthenshire, mm-hmm. uh, Radnorshire. Um, Obviously, a desirable trait, isn't it, to have a to have polled animals? But in, in many cases, when we bring in the pole, it brings a blood from outside, and sometimes would yeah. be detrimental to the carcass. So, is is, is there a for and against that? The, 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 the pole side of it is that is that breaking away from tradition a little bit? No, yeah, it is a little bit, but uh, you know, the, the, we're uh, there's not much. Crossbreeding, one or two have tried it, but it's not. It doesn't really work. I don't think so. Okay. Um, because uh, we, there's always a case of, oh, that that should be a pulled one, and yet it's got horns, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because it's taken over the mother side instead of the bull side, sure. doesn't it? You know, because mainly it's the bulls that are, are um, uh, horns. There are two or two or three herds, Rhyddel herd and Hirwine there. Um, Oh, well, Davis, he's got a polled herd, Castine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, they're, 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 they're polled herds, you see, down in that area. Okay, but, uh, okay, but it, it, there's one, there's one, there's one in, in Merionith, I think. There's one in, just outside Dolgetha in Bristol there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he sells uh, polled cattle in Dolgetha, I know that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, the breed, of course, as I mentioned, is a hardy suckler cow breed and still its main purpose, great milkers, aren't they? But before we move on to the modern day, can we just have a look at some of those, a few of uh, breeders and sires that maybe influenced the breed during those years, maybe from the 60s sort of onwards? I've got I've got a name, Jenkins, here from Mysgrim. Would that be right? He lived till he was 104. What can you tell me about him? <laughs> well, yes, and then his uh, family still still have herds these days. They, uh, he would have been at Neyav, um How well took over the son, and then his son William is running it now. Then there'd be a brother, uh, D. Bennett Jenkins at Caran, mm-hmm. and then at, at Gwilym at Tinnagraig and Argyll. They're all the Jenkins family, you okay. see, in, all in Aberystwyth, in, and having very, very good cows. Uh, you know, like J.M. Jenkins, who you've mentioned, uh-huh. he was president from ni- in 1943-44, okay. and then uh, Bennett was uh, in 1992 to 93. Okay, okay. And these and these families, you see, who are into the blacks, um, people, people, people from the same family come come back in a, for a second and third generation as presidents. You know. Brilliant to see that they, they, they stay at it. And uh, um, yeah, one name I remember going back in my younger days would be Malcolm Richards uh, as, as being a top man, large as life character Malcolm was. And I remember him having a bull called Urch Edward, I think, and uh, it would be back in the in the, I suppose, the late seventies. Yeah, sixties. Yeah, well, well, the, the Erch herd in the sixties and seventies was, you know, 
uh. the herd of the of the time, you know. Um, fortunately, mm. there is one one brother still at it now, and he's his saddle vine is prefix because I don't think anybody with the arch is doing anything. Okay. You know, it's 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 funny that there are herds out uh, out there, and they don't register anymore. It's a pity, really. No. Would some of them still have the cattle, but maybe just not register them, or were they just sort of? Did, did, did... Oh yes, mm. yeah, yeah. There's one, there's one fa- family which you know they sell in Dorgetta quite regular mm. in in the store sale, uh-huh. and they've still got the same type of cattle as they had back in the eighties mm. and nineties and the early two thousand. Okay. But they just haven't registered since, you know. Sure. And I don't know why, you know. No, okay. They keep the black cow the same, you know. <laughs> well, as long as they're making them profit, I suppose that's their, their prerogative, isn't it? And another name that yeah. another name that I want to mention is Major Gibson Watt, and uh, he was a big stalwart for the breed, and he turned up actually in our, in our episode about the Sherrilly cattle a while ago because he uh, he stood very much opposed to the early <laughs> imports of Continentals and uh, some manner. Uh, as well as his stockman would have as well. <laughs> he had very very good stockmen, didn't he? You know, and uh, we've lost him in in the beginning of. To 2020. Uh, and on the the bull side, a, a bull, Cadarock of Glass Cloud was the pin-up bull from the 1930s. He was the one on all the all the posters. Would that be would be an influential bull? Would he be? Yes, um, but uh, you know, later on in the late 60s, early 70s, you'd be you know, the Royal John. Rosslech would have had quite a run of bulls, I should think. Mm-hmm. You know, Rosslech Cow, Rosslech Prince, Rosslech Nero, you know, Nero, you know. And, of course, you've mentioned Park, and it'd be Park Baron, and, you know, there'd be Bulls of the Year, you know, that it'd be... Sure. And the bull of the um, the bull of the year was is something to would that come down through the show ring through the showing to how do they get to the oh yeah the show ring or uh, that's where the bull of the year and that, that's why they have stopped that competition uh, two years ago oh. and, and unfortunately we've not had a chance to trial it out in very in different ways because of this COVID yeah. you know because yeah, um, uh, yeah. we were we were planning to look at it another way okay. Because, you know, the, the number of people that show these days go less and less, don't and they? And the number of the people that show senior bulls go less and less as well, because you're not, doing your, not yeah. doing your bull a lot of good, keeping them in show condition from, from year to year, of course. So. No, no. And, and the thing is, like, if you go back, if you go back to 66, mm-hmm. 1966, when there was 222 bulls offered for sale wow. okay. in, the, in, in, in the sales, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you go to... 2019, yeah, and there was 52, yeah. 52 bulls offered for sale, society sales. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the pool is getting very, very small. Sure, you know, it's getting. We move on by by the year 2000. There were 850 members, so there's still you know still a reasonable membership. There 2,500 head of cattle registered uh, that year, and what what number of, of cattle are being registered uh, this year? Do you know, uh, or last year, should I say? Do you know that old... last year would be, be about around the eighteen twenty eighteen eighteen twenty mark, and that would be from five hundred and ninety registered okay. breeders. Okay, you know. Okay, so you're still you're still there, and and uh, yeah, a powerful force. And of course, the Royal Welsh would be the showcase of the breed. And what sort of numbers do you get at the Royal Welsh these days? Again, we haven't seen a show for a couple of years, but uh, what sort of numbers would be getting there? Well, uh, as you say, this is a showcase of the, you know, and we nearly, we were nearly having to be lose that first ring because there was only eighteen entries in one year there. Yeah. At, anyway, in, in two thousand and nineteen, we did come back to fifty-seven entered, okay. and forty-eight turned yeah. up. No, that's pr- you know, that'd still be uh, the biggest breed in the show. I guess, or biggest numbers from any breed in the show. I guess. No, I think the Limousins and. They have more, okay. I think, don't they? You know, okay. but the Charleys, the Charleys had fallen in two thousand and nineteen. Mm-hmm. I think they were down to about thirteen or fourteen that year. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but there are other problems with this TB and things. Built from that area, you know, TB sure high high risk area, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and people just, you know, 
the way I want to take my cattle to. Absolutely. I mean, right, I've heard tales of people in, in, in the UK moving farms up to Scotland so they can get out of the TB area. So it is, it is a massive issue, of course, amongst, amongst all breeds. Just, just, you mentioned earlier on that the, the, the Welsh Blacks won the Burke Trophy, and they did in 2000. That was a great start to the millennium. And just remind me of the cattle that were in that Burke Trophy pair there uh, you mentioned just now. Manu, William and Mary Gold, yeah. yeah. And both from Martin Stewart. I certainly remember, um, remember them and a great spectacle uh, that they were that, that year. And, and well, and, and, well yeah. and easy winners, I think. <laughs> yes, and uh, I, I, I don't think enough um, mention has gone to the cowmen there who prepared those cattle. <laughs> Uh, Gwyn Roberts, Kilglasson, wasn't it? Oh, you know, was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, or Gwyn, yeah. you know, well, some some showman. You well, know. we'll mention Gwyn because I was going to go on to, of course, the Royal Smithfield show, and the Welsh Black had a great representation at Smithfield and Bingley Hall, for that matter. And I know you brought cattle down, Alban. I, cl- I think I clipped a few out for you going going back the way. First in the nineteen nineties, <laughs> <laughs> and but I, going back a bit earlier than that, it would be the Stowe in his family that I remember that always stick in my mind. Brought cattle to Smithfield and and uh, some great cattle always shown naturally back then though it's sort of long before we got the oh the yes, yeah them. yeah yeah big cattle uh, you know 700 pluses wouldn't they would, they? Yeah, yeah. and and edwards of penball mm-hmm. anglesey uh-huh. uh tom edwards uh will will's big supporter wasn't he you know of the when we were all Jones. blowing and dressing them up they'd just go around with it with a knapsack spray with a bit of water and creosote in there i think and just spray it on them that's and leave it. them to sleep that was that's about all they did and <laughs> go off to the bar <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's it. And you mentioned Gwyn, of course, uh, another great, uh, great man at Smithfield. And another man I want to mention is uh, yeah. uh, Di Jones at Lanny Lar, and I think he went on and won the Queen's Cup at Smithfield. I think it might be the same year, maybe. Um, or was it two thousand as well? And of course, Di, a past president and a great ambassador for the breed and for Wales in general, isn't he? Oh, exactly, exactly. You know, like in two thousand and four, it was his vision. I think when he was president to uh, to start the World Conference. Okay. Because he'd been abroad a number of times, hadn't he? And he'd seen cattle abroad, and it was one of his visions. And mm-hmm. uh, as I say, we were, you know, we've had the World Conference in 208 in Australia, 212 in Germany, uh-huh. 216 in, in New Zealand. Uh-huh. And then we were supposed to have it back in Wales in 2020, okay. because uh-huh. that went by the by. Oh, well, and maybe, maybe it'll still get there yet. And of course, going back to Di, oh, yeah, the yeah. people that don't know Di, of course, he had a TV. Um, Presenter wasn't he, and uh, or isn't he? Should I say, and uh, uh, and a tremendous, a tremendous man, um, and always good, always quick with a joke, and always always had a tale to tell. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, of course, and uh, you know, like like like, like Gwyn won the Queen's Cup as well, didn't okay, he? Okay, yeah, yeah. In in Smithfield, uh-huh. with an egg, with an egg, yeah, beast, okay. um, uh, egg, yeah, will, and the, you know. That's a herd now. It's been taken over by a young lad. Um, no relation to the family there previously, but he has been able to keep the herd. Um, we had the sale for John and Glyn a few years ago. Okay. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. they both passed away by now. Okay. And uh, But, you know, they had some tremendous cattle. Yeah, yeah, Not, ve- not very big, but mm-hmm. very... And always in the, in the, in the dog-etter female mm-hmm. sales they would be in the in the prizes in the money and, and and just i suppose while we're talking about smithville of course the welsh black are a beef breed and and uh welsh black beef has been extremely well marketed or branded i would say in actual fact and, and can you find welsh black beef in the supermarkets these days who, who are the main players uh, slaughtering selected beef for nowadays well we we have got a scheme going through the welsh blacks and um there's a, a premium to be had through key pack mm-hmm. and I don't know what, who they supply in the eventually, but, um, but there are like, yeah. And Edwards, I don't know if you've heard of Edwards of Conway mm-hmm. who does the sausages and things, but he supplies a lot of hotels and catering places with Welsh black beef. Okay. Um, there's mm-hmm. Lorraine and Sue Williams down in, Glamorgan there, they've got a shop and they promote and produce their own um, meats for the shop. Uh, but this is this is what, when we went over to Germany in 2012, mm-hmm. it really opened our eyes out. Um, like every farm we went on, on to, they would have a butcher's, they would have a shop and a butcher's um, right. outlet. Yeah. To, yeah, you know, to sell their meat. 
mm-hmm. and every every farm we went to, you really? know, we, I think we visit, we visited twelve. I think I think the biggest herd when, when we went over in two thousand and twelve was Hans Stucker, mm-hmm. who had a hundred Welsh black cows. Right. And, and selling beef at the farm gate. And, of course, we see a lot of that with uh, now starting to happen, especially with the, the way the Internet and maybe the COVID thing has pushed that forward a little yeah. bit, that people are selling boxed beef uh, sort of over the Internet and what have you. But I think, again, as I said, the, the, as a brand, the Welsh Black would probably be, I'm going to get shot for saying this, probably be second to the Angus as, as actually as, as branded beef. And I know on, on the Welsh Black website, there's a, there's a pretty much a whole page of suppliers of, of Welsh Black beef out there yeah. so uh, anybody wants to get any just go on to the welsh black website and uh, and pick your pick your place and get some on order because it does yeah, it, yeah. It, do, it does eat very well doesn't it i'm sure you'll re- you'll yeah. highly recommend it yeah yeah well you know we're lucky in our in our area here we've got points in golden bay and thunder no mm-hmm. you know colin and, and thunder no and they're supplied by three local farmers with their welsh black beef mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and uh, we're very very lucky well, as I said, it's not just lucky. I think you guys have kept it kept it together as a brand, and and, and a great credit to you and 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 the Welsh nation. And we, we should just maybe have a look at a couple of other top breeders before we get to the end of this this episode. There, I want to mention Hugh Jones. I mentioned earlier on from Bow Street, who sent me some exceptional photographs, forty or fifty of them, I think. So we'll get some of those uh, available on our on our Facebook page later. And who else yeah. should we who else should we mention? Who's at the top of the breed uh, just now? Is there one or two people <laughs> dominating, well, or or, or sharing it around still? Well, at the moment, I just think uh, the Harvard Dress Cup herd would be at the top there. You know, they they hold the record for the top price bull. What is that record? Uh, 22,000 guineas. Okay. Uh-huh. You know, and they're always, uh, always in that 3,000 plus for the yep. females, you know. I don't think we've broken the four yet. I don't okay. think so. I think okay. I think we got close on a couple of occasions, but uh-huh. we don't think we've broken through it. Okay. Um, of said- course, Greg Greg Gorch heard are always uh, producing some fantastic um, and the Seychog, you know, uh, Tequin and uh, yeah. and Emir two brothers. They're mm-hmm. always producing uh, the, the top goods. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, but mm-hmm. lately the top prices have been coming from. Kairanuk heard. Okay. And they, they sold one in January for fifteen and a half thousand. I saw him. I got a picture of him. Yeah, yeah, it looked a good beast. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, and, and then, and then there's Manach uh, Arvon Williams. The Manach heard. Um, they're always uh, good females and bulls, really, from Arvon. Um, uh-huh. Always competitive prices. Uh-huh. Then uh, there's Glyn Williams uh, um, from. So then Dacus in Gutherin with the Dacus herd, he's coming up well lately, you know, okay. with both bulls and females. You know, he's getting towards that 2,000 with his females and, you yeah. know. And, 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 uh, and then Briscaga is always, uh, Briscaga bull comes in the ring and, you know, it'll always sell, you know. Okay. You, you're going back to breeding when J.P. Reese was his past president and he, he his breeding goes back to... Um, Garner, um, and he goes back to being champion bull in the Royal Welsh in 1951 right. okay. to 55. And I think, you know... A lot of that genetic stuff on, pulling and, through you. Yeah. And that, that would be Egrin Garner, you see. And that would be down to Moses Griffiths then, wouldn't it? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. a bull yeah. bred by Moses Griffiths. So we're going back to the same people... Mm-hmm. All the time, and you know, uh, 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 you know, like like in Anglesey, you've got the uh, W.J. Thomas, then his son O.G. Thomas, and now Brian's taken over the Quine uh, herd, and then Carwin's there now as well. You know, okay. there's four generations of singles, and uh, you know, it, it takes years and years, doesn't it? You know, to it certainly does. It's not just one lifetime; you know, it's two or three. You did right. You know, it is a long. It's, it's, a, it's a long commitment. You know, and like. Recently, the Trivial Herd, Johan, Johan Roberts on Anglesey, he's having quite a few successes with his bulls and his females, you know. Good. And uh, um, as I say, there's Sam Achreth, um, Tullinbach, Lewis Williams, Tullinbach, Sam Achreth. Well, he's always got four or five bulls in a, in a sale, mm-hmm. and he's always in that... Ten up to ten thousand for his balls, you know. That's the pen you want to look in when they've got a few of them there to choose from. 
of course, you have the Prince of Wales as your patron, and, and rightly so, but uh, brings me round to yourself, or when you're a, a, a council member of the society and a judge as well, and of course you still run your own uh, Welsh Black Herd there that goes back a couple of generations. Uh, tell me a bit about them. Yeah, well, my grandfather was in... He wasn't in the 1904. He said he was... Uh, my uncle said he was in the 1905 one. Okay. They didn't put anything in the 1904 one. Mm-hmm. Then my father was in nine, in the 60s and 70s, as I said, and I came in 1990. I started my own herd. Mm-hmm. Um, I've only got a small place and uh, seven cows, a couple of heifers, and... Uh, and as well as a judge, I believe you're, you're, you've been an auctioneer as well, haven't you? Are you still? Yes. Are you still? 51 years. 50, no, retired now. Retired okay. <laughs> after 51 years. Uh-huh. But I do remember. I do remember. We had. To, we were sworn to secrecy at the Heen Estate, Rushton Stones. Uh-huh. We were sworn to secrecy because Prince Charles bought six cows from there. Okay. <laughs> but, but we we were sworn to secrecy that we weren't to tell anybody the day before that they were there looking at the cattle. <laughs> okay. And so you, you you sold the cattle, did you, him, did you? <laughs> That's it. Well, well, I was the clerk on the day. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and and you do judge. I think you judged. Uh, be right in thinking you judged the last society, sir. Would that be right? Or certainly recently, anyway. Yeah. Um, Twelve months to last January, wasn't it? You know. Now. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I did the Royal Welsh in 2017. Uh-huh. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, you talk about the Royal Welsh, and um, I, the Royal Welsh, I hope, will be full swing this year, and I'm planning on coming down there with a few sheep myself for our winter. So we'll catch up and get a beer. In fact, we'll we'll catch up and get one of those fantastic breakfasts at the Welsh Black Building there. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the one. The, that's the, the one. The best place to get <laughs> yeah. a breakfast in, in, in all the shows I think I've ever been to. And uh, Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and a dinner at night time. Yes. As, as for Evans, the Shadley man, where he goes for his <laughs> for his meal in the evening. <laughs> no, not just him. I know a lot of my pals from Scotland come down there. And they, they do head straight to the to the Welsh Black Building there, and and of course yeah. the fine spectacle there that we'll see of the great breed. And I hope you're back in. You know, got those numbers back up again uh, again this year. And, and uh, have you, you do you still show a few of yours, or have you you retired from that one now? No, no. I I went in 2019. I had a bull and one heifer down there. Okay. Well, it was funny, you know, when the numbers had got down to mm-hmm. 18 the year before, our chairman of council, Reddit, uh, our director, he said, well, he said, there's 35 of us on council, he said. If we all took one animal, he said, <laughs> we'd have 35 entries. <laughs> so, so I'll give you a challenge today in the council meeting, you know. Well, makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, of course... Uh, Six or seven of us took him t- took him up, and he was yeah. quite surprised to get that number in. But yeah. as I say, that, you know that, that there are herds. You know, like like as, as I mentioned, the Jenkinses, the Karen, mm-hmm. the, you know, Tinnacraig, and the boys to beat. Yeah, yeah they're the lads who, who show as well. And in all fairness, there's one who's out there, and she goes to every show at the moment. And she's only got a small herd. It's Lynn Foxwell. I don't know if you the the Ruthed herd and. She's had the first bull into uh, genus recently. Okay. Sex semen, you see. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've, we've, we've been trying to go down that line for a few years. Mm-hmm. Of course, we, we had a big problem back in 2010 when they wouldn't allow the Welsh Blacks into the Tir uh, Glastir. You know. Why? Uh, well, this, this is bureaucracy gone mad, I, we thought at the time. <laughs> you know. Because, uh, you know, as Welsh Black did not previously qualify for this status, mm-hmm. more more careful presentation of statistics to those who compile the register does now mean that the breed qualifies for the at-risk okay. status for 2015. Okay. At, at-risk status were allowed in. And we missed five years. And what took over with the Herefords, Aberdeen Angus, and the Shorthorns and the Lings. <laughs> and were they, were they at, at, at risk status, <laughs> according to according to the people on the top? Yes, they were. Okay. And in fairness, uh, the late Elvid Williams made many representations uh, to the government or whoever runs these bloody things, <laughs> you know. To get yourselves in the... Oh, well. Sounds, yeah. like you, sounds like you're getting your numbers up anyway, now, so... 
Well, the registrations, you know, the steered registration was go straight up now mm. because since, since 2020, uh, you know, the, 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 the 30p, well, up to 30 pence bonus is back up with key pack. Okay. So, you know, we'll get registrations on the steer side as well now, sure. which sure. Is, is always like, you know, if you, I know it's only, I think it's £7 an animal with, for, mm. for, for, for the steers. We're seven. A thousand, thousand registrations, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely worth having. And Owen, definitely worth having you uh, on the programme. Now, it's been great to hear about the Welsh Black Breed, and I'm, I won't apologise that we gave a, a bit of a history lesson of some of the earlier cattle there at the beginning there, but I hope people listening to this have... Uh, uh, I've heard the merits of the of the great Welsh black breed and the tradition that that goes with it, and uh, and the yeah. passion. The passion, I would say, is probably above above any other breed. The passion you guys have for that breed well, is second to none. Well, you know, you know, you you go on, you know, into the breeding, and you got like the Nay I've heard, as I said, you know, William Jenkins and the Jenkins family. Mm. But, you know, like the, the Nay are there with the sixty eight Nay the cow the two twentieth. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, sure, the 220th, yeah, that's, that says yeah. a lot how long and, you've guys have been there. And, and of course, near David D, 186, left mm-hmm. his mark on the breed okay. in the, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, into the 80s, well into the 80s, 90s probably. Yeah. It still does today with some of them, because some of them still got blo- uh, some semen left, you see, mm. and they're using it. Well, long may um, it continue unless you get you into the 300s as well. But as I said, uh, um, I'm looking forward to being down at the Royal Welsh uh, this year and seeing some of this great breed. And uh, oh, and I really appreciate your time there and in, in, in sharing the history with, with our listeners. OK, very good. Well, thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast, which was kindly sponsored by Harbro, suppliers of quality commercial and pedigree feeds and expert nutritional advice. Visit their website or find them on Facebook for more information. And while on the subject of Facebook, why don't you visit the Top Lines and Tales Facebook page, where you'll find photographs and more information to back up this episode.